Welcome to Greenlit, the Buffalo 8 podcast. I'm your host, Matthew Halderman, and each week we're going to dive into a different piece of content, film and television, and we're going to talk with some of the biggest names in front of and behind the camera as we dive deep into how they were financed, produced, developed, marketed, and the crazy stories behind how many of them got made. Welcome back to Greenlit. On today's episode, I'm chatting with Dolph Lundgren. Dolph is best known for starring opposite of Sylvester Stallone in Rocky IV, playing the well-known boxer Ivan Drago, the Russian nemesis in the film. Dolph's probably one of the best-known characters in the Rocky franchise, and that is ultimately what I think most of the world came and has come to know him by. But getting to know Dolph over the last couple of years, having made a movie with him about three years ago now called Blackwater, we were prepping another film called Castle Falls, which got shut down during coronavirus. I've come to see that Dolph is so much more than just that actor that people know him and the characters that he plays. Dolph is an intellectual, having given up an opportunity to go to MIT, where he was studying to become a chemical engineer, as well as a Fulbright scholarship recipient. Goes without saying, he's an athlete from fighting and training and karate and martial arts, but he's also an artist. And so he's this incredible everyman who is really reflective now in looking back on his life. Today, we spend the majority of the time talking about Rocky IV, but also the backdrop about how the films that he has starred in have changed the way he's thought about his own life, his legacy that he wants to leave behind, fatherhood, as well as the way he thinks about the entertainment business and the ways that it's changed since he joined it almost 40 years ago. So without further ado, enjoy this conversation with Dolph Lundgren. Welcome back to Greenlit. This morning, I'm chatting with Dolph Lundgren. Dolph, thanks for taking the time. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. So Dolph has a really awesome story uh, that has a lot of twists and turns, and I want to get into a lot of that, and we've got a lot of ground to cover in 40 minutes or so. We want to be respective of his time. So let's start with Rocky IV and how that project got greenlit for you and how that project changed uh, your trajectory and really your life in, in so many ways. Wow. Yeah, that's, um, that's a big moment in my life for sure. I, I was a chemical engineering student in, uh, at Sydney University on a uh, Fulbright scholarship and uh, down there on, as an exchange student. And um, I started doing some modeling. Somebody got me into modeling to make a few bucks on the side. I was also working as a bouncer at a club in Sydney and I was fighting. I was... Um, competing in the Australian Open, which I actually ended up winning. Um, and, um, you know, I met, I, I, one job was uh, to, to do security at rock concerts. And uh, this friend of mine who was a fighter, uh, who I used to spar with, he was a boxer, but, you know, he was a tough guy. So I, he was big enough to take, take punishment that I would dish out in those days. So he, him and I got a job through another guy to work at these rock concerts. And it was like Joan Armour trading. It was Dr. Hook. It was like very, very 80s type of bands, you know, uh, men at work. Um, and anyway, and one was Grace Jones, and who it was, you know, was a black singer, um, a very interesting woman. And, and I was posted on the, on the stage door for some reason in the back, you know, uh, and when she was at the end of her concert, uh, you know, I was standing there and she, she was in there with a bunch of people. I, I kind of knew who she was a little bit. And I was just standing there. It was like maybe 11 o'clock or something. And I, I had to get up the next morning to go to school. And, and she kind of clocked me out there. I, I mean, I, I realized afterwards she, she invited me and my friend Mark, the, the fighter, um, to, to do security when she went to a club with maybe 10 other people. And then we ended up going back to her hotel suite, which is a big suite. I'd never seen a big suite like that, you know, uh, being a you know, Swedish young kid from Sweden, exchange student. Uh, my room was like a closet, you know, at the <laughs> university. So I was up there with Mark, and he was kind of hitting on her. He was a big, good-looking guy, and, and um, a little bit. But I, I didn't, you know, I didn't do anything. I was just there, and her agent was there, and a bunch of people, uh, you know, Australian uh, a lot of people in the gay scene in Australia, I remember. Um, Sydney was a big gay capital, kind of mm. San Francisco, and a lot of fans were gay. And I was up there feeling a little bit out of my element. So, and then sooner, you know, people started leaving, and 
I guess Grace had a few drinks and there was like one left and the other one left. And then her, you know, finally, uh, it was like, I think me, Mark, the, the fighter and her agent who was actually passed away in AIDS, nice guy, you know, from New York who was traveling with her. And um, we were up there and I guess, however it happened, Mark left and finally Bob who was the agent and it was me and her in the room. And I started realizing why I had been hired in the first place. And, uh, you know, one thing led to another. <laughs> I missed a few classes in, in the next morning in school at university. But uh, we ended up having a relationship, falling in love. I, I mean, really did. And, and she, I, I had to finish school. And I, um, I went to Tokyo after school, was done to practice karate. And I met her because she was doing a commercial there. I went back to New York with her. And I had six months before I was going to start at MIT in Boston. I uh, had a Fulbright scholarship there. Uh, actually, the scholarship to Australia was a regular exchange student program, but then a Fulbright scholarship to MIT. My dad's favorite school, he was an engineer, and I was really excited. And I had six months to kind of blow off in New York with Grace. Well, you know, I, I was introduced to a totally different world. People like Andy Warhol, and Dave Bowie, and Michael Jackson. Uh, I met all of these, you know, uh, Scavulo, all of these big photographers. Uh, this, I remember this Italian young designer came in from Milan. He was his first shop in, in um, Manhattan. He, he did, made me a leather jacket. I guess he had a bit of a crush on me, probably. It was Johnny Versace. Oh. And um, so, you know, I, I was in the middle of all of that. And then when it was time to go to school, I wasn't that excited about chemical engineering anymore. Right? And I ended up, I ended up uh, instead I studied some acting because I'd done some modeling in Australia. and. Uh, I met his acting coach, Warren Robertson, and it turned out that, you know, he was actually friends with, uh, um, with Bert Young. Yeah, I didn't know that. Bert Young was in the Rocky series. And around this time, then, I reckon Stallone was sitting at home in Beverly Hills working on this next Rocky uh, sequel, where he was going to, it was Reagan, this was like the Reagan era, you know. Um, it was still Cold War and Gorbachev and Reagan, and, and uh, he was going to fight a Russian guy. So he was mm. working on the script, I guess, up at his house. And he kind of created this, you know, you know, machine-like man, kind of perfect man, Russian stereotype, big, blonde guy. And, and, uh, and you know, at the same time, I was in New York. I was doing some boxing um, at Gleason's Gym and starting acting. And, you know, it was kind of meant to be because... I went in for the call. There was a big cattle call, hundreds of people, and they turned me down for being too tall. But I sent photos off. I was up at a restaurant, and, and Warren was there, and I took my motorcycle back downtown to uh, the village where Grace lived and got some 8 by 10 shots on myself in boxing gear. And, and this friend of Stallone, uh, John Hertz, Hertzfeld, John, one of his oldest friends from college, uh, I was a director. He took the pictures just alone. So what happened was six months later or so, I'm in, I'm in uh, London. Grace is doing a view to kill with, uh, you know, uh, with uh, Roger Moore, a Bond movie. And I'm, I got a little walk on part in it. And then just some guy just calls me up from Hollywood, some PA sweating. Oh, thank God I got a hold of you. And Sly was going to kill me, basically. And then finally they tracked me down. And I flew to LA and um, you know, met Stallone, and then I had to audition for six months, train, put on weight. Had to, uh, then I had to do a screen test with two other Russian guys, actually. There were three of us left, two big Russians and me. And, but they were playing the character very much like a Russian Mr. T. I will kill you, I will, I will destroy you. Whereas I decided, with my coach's help, to play him very internal, like just stand there and say, you know, I must break you. And it was very, very uh, it's minimalistic. And it worked. So I got the part and I moved to LA. Uh, you know, now it's 74 movies later, and, uh, 35 years. So, so excellent. So I want to come back to, uh, yeah. I, want to, I, just, I want to come back to so many things in that story. Yeah. Funny enough, uh, we actually, one of the first movies I ever worked on was a John Hertzfeld movie. It was a movie called Reach Me that John directed uh, that, that Sly was actually in. And this must have been like 2000. 
2011, 2012. And I remember I met Stallone just once. I want to talk about Sly for, for a moment, but I met him just once. And I remember being so taken aback that similar to you, there's many aspects of his personality. He's an intellectual, right? He's a painter. He's very, very uh, red. He's, he's very well read. Um, and I found that super interesting, especially given like this stereotype that these actors in the 80s got typecast as, as who they were as people when it really wasn't that at all when I actually met him. Did you find that, you know, coming from New York and, and, and working your way into it and now going out to LA, did you have an expectation for what Stallone was going to be like and what that experience was going to be like? And then maybe that was different? Oh, yeah, uh, for sure. I... You know, I'd been when I fought in the Australian Open in in um, in, in Sydney. I was playing some of the Rocky Three uh, music, Eye of the Tiger, to kind of you know while I was waiting for my fights. You know, laying in the in my changing room with a Walkman in those days. And little did I know that you know two years later I was going to be be flown into Los Angeles, and then I was in a taxi. I remember in those days, and I was he had an office at Paramount Studios, so I. You know, you drive up, you come up, whatever that is, if it's maybe, could it be Western Avenue or something, and you, you go north and you see the Hollywood sign, and then you see Paramount Studios, and I went through the gates, and I went in his office there, and he was ready for uh, uh, Rambo 2. He was going to shoot Rambo 2 when he had the long hair, so he came out. He just showed up, came out, hey, how you doing? You know, he came out, it was... It was tanned and buffed and long hair, and I was like, "Whoa!" I was starstruck, you know, immediately. <laughs> and then he he got me into the office. He was very very nice, um, and he showed me he's got you know uh, five thousand guys up for this role. He showed me I was before computers that had like you know binders with photos all over the place. And then we took some Polaroids and and we put shorts on. Took some Polaroids. I had one for a long time, and I don't know. I lost it somewhere along the way. And, uh, and at first, I, 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 I react to the fact that he was very normal and down to earth and nice, yeah. which is true for a lot of movie stars, you know, big actors, not all of them, but there's some that are very down to earth. You kind of realize how they, why they're big movie stars, because, you know, you have to be liked by the common man to be a movie mm -hmm. star. Actor, to be an actor is something different, you know, but, a movie star is somebody who lives next door, but just is something a little more special about them, you know. Right. Um, so, um, like Julia Roberts. And but anyway, uh, so I was impressed by that. But then when I started working with him, when I got the part, you're right. I was very impressed that he had it all figured out. He he had the choreography down. He was a good, pretty. Good, he was a good uh, fighter. I mean, I was a champion, and we were sparring, and he kept up with me. He was ten years older than me at the time. He had all the music already uh, made for the picture. So he had all the music. So we were actually fighting to the music. Instead of writing the music later, he had the music already written. And he had those songs, Eye of the Tiger. You know, uh, the, 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 the Rocky IV, uh, not the score, but a lot of these other songs that were used in the montage. It's like Eyes of Fire, Hearts of Fire is one. There's some other... Uh, music so so i was very impressed that he was so detail oriented you know like everything had to be perfect and you know i got a script uh i got the script of the movie and then i got another script that was about 40 pages of just round one left 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 right left hook move it, it was a page after page so i had to memorize that and it's strangely enough i still remember some of it 35 years later is never gone, you know, it's sort of like, uh, it's like learning Shakespeare. You never forget it. Um, this is a different type of Shakespeare. Anyway, but he, uh, yeah, I was very su surprised that he was, uh, and I've gotten to know him since then. Of course, he's a very intellectual, very smart guy. And as, for instance, Arnold Schwarzenegger, you know, people realized that, of course, when he became governor and all that, that he wasn't just a dumb guy in the gym lifting weights, which, you know, with a funny accent. So I, I've obviously been looked upon the same way. I came from an intellectual background. My parents were academics, and then my whole younger life, I was my whole way to 
to, to sort of, uh, my identity was based on that I was, you know, good students, basically. Uh, and now, of course, I've played, you know, tons and tons of these, you know, various, you know, stone cold killers and fighters and people like with, <laughs> who solve a problem by, you know, hauling up an assault rifle and blowing the other person away, you know. So just lately have I played a little more sensitive characters, but, you know, it's, yeah, I'm, I'm a victim of the Stallone thing where people think he is Rocky and he is, you know, speaks one word at a time and, and <laughs> it's slow, right. but it's, it's, it's totally, it's, it's the opposite. Right. So I want to come back again, because I think that's an important part of your growth and your evolution. But I want to talk for a second, Dolph, about Rocky Four comes out. Obviously, it's a, it's a big movie. And I remember growing up and it being a, one of the probably the one of the biggest in the franchise. Let's just put it at that. And your character in particular, one of the most noteworthy in the franchise, besides Sly, maybe the most noteworthy in the franchise. How much changes overnight? Did you did you know how much was was changing in real time? And at that point, did you say, "All right, I'm, I'm buckling up for a for a different kind of ride than I thought this was potentially going to be"? Like you said, coming from an academic background and an athletic background, the entertainment business, as we, you and I know, is a is a wild beast in, in and of itself. Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I. You know, I started studying acting because I ran into Warden Robertson, who was Grace's coach, who helped her on um, on the Bond movie. But he also coached, like uh, he, he was coaching um, a lot of big actors in the back in the in the eighties and nineties. You know, Academy Award winning type of actors. And uh, you know, I wanted to when I first did some scenes there, I realized I had some emotional stuff going on that I had repressed a lot. Hmm. by being a fighter because I had a big problem with my dad when I was a kid. Hmm. You know, he was very violent, you know, and with me and my mom. So I had this sort of, I had this trauma that I, I couldn't, I didn't really know what it was. I had never done therapy or anything, but I, obviously I was a uh, troubled teen and I stole motorcycles and got drunk and ran away from home and all that when I was about 12, 13. And then I stabilized uh, because my dad sent me away up north to my grandparents, uh, Northern Sweden. And I became, you know, good at school. I uh, became a, an athlete and all of that. So, you know, what happened was um, when I started acting, I started tip, dipping into those emotions. And I, I had no, uh, you know, no uh, plan to become an action star. I just wanted to see what that was all about. You know, I felt good when I, if, my coach made me cry on stage, or I got really emotional, I got, or I got to vent some anger, or whatever it was. So I wasn't, you know, then I got caught up in this Rocky thing, when I, and I didn't realize how big it was going to be. I had really no clue. I, I, you know, I remember walking into the premiere, which was in Westwood. It was, um, there was a new head of MGM. It was, um, what's his name? Um, he used to, he used to, uh, Weintraub. Jerry Weintraub, who was like a showman, right? He had a huge office. He was a big guy. They had a huge opening with elephants and marching bands and whatever it was in and, uh, and, and, uh, Westwood. And I was with Grace. And uh, we came out of a limo, and she's dressed in a huge hat. And she's got, like, leather coats and, you know, gloves. And everybody's trying to get me get rid of it. Who is that big guy? He's in the way, you know, like... I want to take pictures of Grace. So it's like, excuse me, sir, he didn't move. So, of course, I, I walk in the theater and I hadn't seen the picture because I didn't cut the picture. I hadn't, hadn't seen it. I'd done some ADR, but I sat down with her and, you know, and uh, Sloan was there. And when the movie, uh, the lights went down and these two gloves, you know, they, they collide, remember? It's Russia versus America. And of course, you know, 90 minutes later, it was a great movie. I mean, I was moved and so was everybody else in the theater and the lights came up and suddenly everybody's looking at me. And I was like, what the hell? And we came out and they're taking pictures of me right there. It's 90 minutes later. Right. Yeah. So my world just started spinning and uh, it took me, I'd say about five years to, to sort of get my bearings back. I, I, I lost grace. We broke up. 
I, uh, st- I had this manager who ripped me off. I had to fire. I got, you know, a bad advice. Things happened in my career that I, things I didn't want to do. Uh, I mean, I, I did the world tour for Rocky IV, and it was all, I was this 27-year-old stud, you know, single. I mean, this is in the 80s. You can imagine. It wasn't like, it wasn't like I went to bed at, you know, 930 every night. It was certainly 9.30 a.m., you know, and uh, right. I, it was just, <laughs> and so I had no idea. And it's, I think it was somebody said that, you know, getting famous, it's, you really kind of go crazy a little bit, you know, whoever you are. It's not normal for people to talk to you like they know you very well and you never met them in your life. But they right. think they're your, you're their best friend and they'll tell you all kinds of, they'll cry or they'll, you know, hug you and you changed my life. It, it still happens to me now. Now I kind of get it, but then I didn't. So um, it, was a, it was a huge thing, a huge thing. And Stallone was there to guide me, you know, when I was uh, co-starring in Rocky IV. But after that, I was starring in my own movies. And, and uh, he wasn't nowhere to be found. And I didn't have anybody in America. I had no family. I you know, a manager who turned out to be a bad guy and uh, a drug addict. Not a bad guy, he's just a drug addict. But I, I did the whole thing. <laughs> I had to go through the, like you said, the yeah. gates of hell. The gates of hell to uh, kind of reclaim my life and uh, through sports and through some, some family and through friendship, I kind of managed to hang on to and save my original personality to some degree. You know, which I think some people never do. And they, you know, you pick up an old magazine and people magazine from 15 years ago and you see who's still in the business of those faces. Usually it's not many. Right. Right. Well, it's a, it's a perfect segue to you. You made the comment about being able to stay grounded enough after re- regaining your bearings to maintain the parts of your personality, your, your real true authentic personality before Rocky. You have always struck me uh, as this sort of student of everything you do with genuine curiosity and enthusiasm. I think about it with your academics, think about it with obviously sport and how much fitness is still a big important part of your life. And not like you said, in sort of the meathead way, but in the way of you actually pursue it and, and, and are a student of it and love it and it impacts the other areas of your life. And now we were preparing to make a movie together that you were directing and starring in and producing before the coronavirus halted it for the time being. During those days and you know, maybe fast forward through those five chaotic years after Rocky, did you know that filmmaking and content and directing and producing that becoming a student of this craft was going to be another chapter in that sort of pulling the thread of curiosity that you seem to have always had? Mm, it's a good question. Yeah. You, I, um, I think you're right. I think that early on I had this curiosity of life and I, I think as a young man or a young boy, I realized that life is, it doesn't go on forever. And, you know, I, I try to try all of these things, <laughs> try to be like my dad, then I try to be like my karate instructor, then I try to, you know, then I try to, um, you know, be like my professor. I uh, try to, I, but you know, you can't have the, no, you can't be the world champion in karate and win the Nobel Prize. You have to somehow, you got to stop, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you can't be, win the Nobel Prize and get the Oscar or be a movie star and a, and a world champion at the same time. And that's why I ended up having to know when to step off, like one you know, step from one, you know, jump from one uh, car to the next, you know, almost like in a, whatever, in a race. I had to jump from, like, you know, academics to sports and, and then to movies. And I thought that I, I did think about directing, and I, I was working on a script, actually, when I got the role – in the Rocky IV movie for me and Grace to do something. It was a bike. It was like a motorcycle picture. I remember now it was, I think it was called Interstate, uh, Interstate 10 or something. It was about, you know, that goes from Florida to uh, Santa Monica. I think it goes Mm -hmm. straight to America. It was kind of road movie. I was working on that. So I always had that 
aspiration because I used to paint, I used to play music as a kid. So I was kind of, I had that sort of aesthetics part of me, but you know, the movie business and women and, you know, money and all the craziness just kind of swept me away for 20 years. And then I got married. Uh, my ex-wife hated LA. She didn't want to live here. She wanted to move first to New York, which we did. Then we moved to London a little bit and then to Spain. So I lived in Spain for 10 years and my kids grew up there. And, and uh, you know, I directed a couple of small movies um, back then, but it wasn't like until late, like maybe six, seven years ago, I started doing meditation and therapy. And I got into that whole problem with my dad and like trauma and why I was so, uh, why I couldn't, relax like why i was kind of running around it's called escape behavior you're trying to escape like uh, like ptsd you're trying to escape from something that's in here you know if you're a soldier and it, you know you, you can't get away you have to deal with it you can't drink you can't you know go on another mission or you know have a sexual affair it's not going to cure it it's just a way to try for you to feel better but so i i kind of got through that and that's one when, when i kind of knew that I think I'm able to give more now as a director and, and you know, ex express myself a little bit through cinema that I, before I wanted to do it, but I, you know, had all these other issues. Plus I was getting, you know, offers to do this and do that. And all the expandable pictures, those three movies came out one after another and so forth. But I, I do look up to Stallone for his, you know, he's a very smart guy and for his cinematic, uh, you know, uh, kind of instincts. And, and even though I, you know, um, I don't know what school I come from, but I'm more interested in, in, um, in, in sort of uh, redemption and, and healing and, and things like that, which is kind of where I, that I've gone through. Right. Well, I, well I'm I, sure he is too, by the way, like all filmmakers, you know. Right. I want to come back to Expendables and Creed. Because I think that's a nice yeah. sort of you know, full circle. But I had had a chance to watch your TED Talk uh, a while ago, uh, before you and I had met, before you know, Castle Falls or anything like that. And I, again, I think that was a, uh, I'm just clicking around and sort of exploring the, the TED website or I don't even remember how I stumbled on it. But again, that struck me as someone who, like you said, has been reflective and thoughtful as opposed to this persona that unfortunately being a movie star and an action star creates for you. Did you think as you went through that process of you know, self-reflection, self-healing, and this is a really deep question that I didn't prepare for at all, but it just strikes me as something we should uh, at least mention. As you went through that and really reflected on it and that experience with your dad, did it change the way you thought about acting, the way you sort of prepared for characters or the things you brought to those characters? and? made you a different actor perhaps oh definitely definitely i mean there's so much to it that is, is a big question but you know you're standing up there on stage for that ted talk totally when by yourself and you're kind of naked and you're talking about some extremely personal matters it, it was you know it's 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 a, a kind of a life-changing experience emotionally anyway. because once you've spoken to them about it once you've done it there, it's sort of off your chest a little bit. And once it's off my chest, I'm, it's much easier for me to use it because I'm not caught up in it. So I can now use it as a tool, more like a tool, you know, as an actor. Now, it, it's kind of fun to delve into what my dad did to me and how that made me feel and all that pain. And it, It's okay now because I've, I've kind of exercised it. And, and that talk was, was a great way to do it. I did it in therapy, but obviously that's in front of one person, you know, that's in front of my therapist. But uh, yeah, it did change it. And I think that, um, I think it kind of uh, made me want to, it, it made me, th well, it was another, you know, typical it, things happen for a reason. I mean, then I get this, you know, I get the role in Aquaman and Creed too, and they're both about fa fathers. One has a daughter who's running away, who's, whose life is in danger, and I have two daughters, you know, who I love very much. And then the other one is about a dad who terrorizes his son, and now I play the dad. 
So I spoke to my, um, uh, th- my acting coach who I've been working with, Larry Moss, who's a great guy. You know, he's one of the best in the world. I mean, I've been friends with him for 30 years because he used to work for Warren Roberts and he used to, he used to study there and teach. But I started working with him. Uh, and he was, I remember he said something like, uh, whether it was Aquaman or Creed 2, you know, he knows my background, my dad. And he said, you know, Dolph, he said, do you know how many people are going to watch this picture worldwide? Do you know how many, um, do you know how many young men or, you know, fathers will watch this and you can have such an impact on, on their life, you know. You don't, don't underestimate that. So I, 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 I was in it for that reason. And that's, for instance, now when I do a movie like Castle Falls, I'm thinking in terms of, okay, what, what can I, what can I express to the world, to, to the viewer? Well, you know, my experience is something that I think is important to me, you know, of human connecting on a human level or human relationships that I don't, I mean, the movie has to be exciting and all that. I know that, but that's not really why I'm interested in it. So as an actor now, I, I only do things like if I feel like I can do that. And if I feel I can tap into that, because that's kind of my secret a little bit. You know, that's my, my edge is that I, you know, I'm not afraid of going to that place at all. And for a big guy who looks like me, who, you know, like you said, you know, you play the total opposite or, you know, a small part of my personality, which is the guy who can't be defeated, who is like, just going to, you know, just going to beat yourself. Us, you know what I mean? <laughs> if you argue with him, that guy is <laughs> that is part of me, a little bit of me. But if you combine those two together, that's quite powerful. Stallone is one guy who's done it to some degree as well. That's why I think him and I are very close. I think you know I, I don't want to speak out of turn, but I believe he has similar uh, experiences as a boy as I did. Let's go deeper on the Stallone piece, just with the friendship and the, <clears throat> the professional and the, the working relationship over the years. So now Expendables, obviously a franchise of its own, and you've been involved all the way through. And then now with Creed as well, obviously you guys have had this relationship now, what is it, Dolph? Is it 40 plus years, you, you, you and Sly? Let's see, I met him in 1984. So what is that? That's, is that... 36 years, right? Isn't it? Yeah. 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 36 years. Yeah. And so Expendables, obviously a really fun sort of a reunion for many of you guys to do something that really introduced that kind of storytelling and action to a new generation, a new audience that didn't grow up with those 80s movies. Many of them weren't even born yet. I remember talking to kids that had worked here with us that those 80s movies were, were, were out before they were born. And expendables to them that was how they connected with a number of the characters in those movies what was that like i remember being in can when you guys were launching one of those films and it was a huge deal and you know, avi Lerner and you guys had taken over the carlton hotel and there was a big sort of old school showmanship about the launch of that movie which was fun because it felt like uh, the, the old days the heyday of the movie business and the action movie business yeah, man. Yeah, look, I mean, I, I was, uh, like I said before, I was living in Spain and I, my career was kind of going down in the toilet, more or less. It wasn't going very well. I was doing really small movies and they were getting worse and I wasn't living in LA. I didn't have, I lost some touch with the business and, and I just got a call, you know, from my agent saying, you know, Sly wants to talk to you. And, and I called him and I, I'd met him a few times. We'd talked about old times where we had a few tequila shots. You know, over the, this is like 20 years after Rocky IV. Yeah, so it was 2000, 2009. He called me and he just, uh, hey, I got the script. You know, check it, see what you think. He said, yeah, check out the script. So I got the script and I, I hadn't read a Stallone script since Rocky IV. And, and he's a good, great writer. He's very funny. I mean, he laughed through the way, you know, very, very uh, great sense of humor. And of course, on page three, you know, Gunner Jensen, drunk Swede with a huge knife, whatever it was. I was like, okay, I, I think I, I get, I get it, <laughs> I get it. And he had me, you know, come in, blow some guy away to like his boots are left, whatever it was, some pirate or something. 
And then, um, you know, I, I ended up doing a picture and I remember meeting him on set. He was directing the first one and then we hugged each other and it felt really great. And, uh, you know, um, and, uh, oh, Jason Statham, I didn't know him. I met him, but I knew Mickey Rourke and, you know, I knew some of the other guys, Arnold and, but you're right. It was like an old school, you know, um, throwback picture, uh, where I know I heard that kids would buy a ticket in a cinema, in a multiplex because it was, it was, um, it was R. It was an R rated picture, right? So they would buy a picture for something else and then sneak in from that theater to the other one to see Expendables because that's where the heads blew up or whatever it was. And, you know, guys were being <laughs> cut to pieces. So, you know, Stallone, he, he doesn't hold back on the violence. And it was, it was a lot of fun on a personal level. I, I was back on a big screen. I, I ended up working with Arnold and Bruce Willis and a few other guys. And, and like you said, you know, I think we were Expendables too. We were in uh, can. You're right. And, and they were, we were riding in these uh, tanks or they were like armed personnel carriers. Yeah. And, then, and I remember in the morning, we show up at 10 o'clock, you know, and there's two of these APCs. They're real ones, but they got the rubber threads on, like you're in parades, so you don't chew up the concrete. But anyway, uh, the street. So uh, slides there, and I remember him going, okay, uh, uh, okay, let's see now. Mel, you go on that one over there with me. Dolph, you with me. Arnold, you go to that one. I mean, who would stand there going, Hey, Harrison, you can go in the back of the... It's like wondering all these huge stars around. Everybody's just like, okay, I guess I'm sitting over here. <laughs> it's like a school, school trip. But who else? I, was, I remember reflecting, what other guy in Hollywood could do that? Nobody. They wouldn't take orders from anybody else. But anyway, was, so the whole experience has been kind of surreal, but a, very, a lot of fun. And... and uh, you know, Sly and I just have some some kind of connection. And, um, I don't know. We I look up to him. He's kind of a mentor, but we have become more friendly over the years because now, as as we're getting older, we have daughters who are about the same age and so forth. So that whole experience, uh, Expandables. Yeah, there's a fourth one, I guess, in the works as well. So it, it hasn't stopped yet. Right. Do you do you credit Expendables? You know, by your own uh, words, you, know, you felt that your career wasn't going where you wanted it. Did you feel like Expendables was a big refresh, and then that led to things like Creed? And now I know you're in, you're doing the voice work and, and things like Minions and some some big picture work again. Yeah, I, you're right. Yes, they did um, for sure. Expendables brought me back, and uh, I moved back to LA. I got divorced at that time. I moved back to LA, so now I, I can build my career again. Um, um, I'm still friends with my ex-wife. She lives in Spain with my youngest daughter, and then my oldest daughter is now uh, with me here in Sweden, actually. But yeah, it brought me back, um, you know, to some degree. But I think what was, you know, was connected to Stallone uh, with Expendables, and they have Creed Two, where they wanted to bring that character back, uh, a Drago, and I didn't want to do it at first. I thought. Oh shit! It's just going to be like, um, like uh, you know, I'm going to be used as some kind of evil Russian guy, and I didn't didn't want to step on that sort of uh, iconic, you know, Rocky IV uh, character because there is something. I think it was um, uh, Kevin Costner. I, I listened to an interview with him once, and I remember he said something like, "You know, you, it's very hard to know what, what's a classic movie." It, it, you don't know. It takes at least seven to ten years to know, okay, that movie is a classic, could be a classic. This one made a lot of money. It doesn't mean it's going to be a classic. Or well, you got good reviews. It doesn't mean people are going to watch it 20 years from now, or unless they have to. But some movies are always there, and they always come back, whether it's Dirty Dancing or you know, Rocky IV. I mean, there's some of them. And Rocky IV, I think, was one of them. There are other ones yeah. that you know they you know, that, that you could, you know, and uh, it takes a while to figure it out. So uh, when they wanted to bring the character back, I didn't want to mess with it. But then when I read the script, I realized it was really great characterization, a way for me to kind of, you know, um, to try to make amends for all that havoc I re reigned upon, you know, Apollo Creed and a few others back in the 80s. Uh, be, um, you know, to be uh, kind of be forgiven for all that death and destruction 
uh, as, a, as a Soviet machine. So I, uh, I, I enjoyed working on that. And I know that the, the uh, James, uh, James Wan, who directed um, uh, uh, Aquaman, that, that came before Creed too. He, he was a big fan of He-Man. And he had seen me also in some interviews. So he was the one who wanted Warner Brothers to hire me uh, to play like King Nerys, but I think they didn't, they didn't want to hire me. They, they, they weren't sure. So I had to do a, my second screen test in my career. I did for Aquaman. Aquaman. Um, just uh, a scene I had to do from Excalibur. They didn't want to give the script out, so I did another scene, like some Excalibur or whatever it was, and um, and that that was quite nice to be hired just to play a kind of politician, you know. <clears throat> Deal maker guy who wasn't like an ass kicker. So, uh, <laughs> that, but it's taken 35 years. <laughs> there are 35 years to get back to not being an ass kicker. <laughs> I know. Go figure, man. It's crazy. Yeah. Well, we're, we're, we're coming up on time here, and I have two things I want to uh, end with. One is a, a serious question that we end you know, all of these interviews with, and one of them is, is a favor, although you've done it a few times throughout this. First is looking back now at early days of your career uh, and now sitting where you sit, what piece of advice do you give yourself looking back in the rear view mirror as the young, young kid going into uh, that, uh, <laughs> the, 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 the business from day one? You mean if I could speak to myself back then? Yeah. Oh, jeez. I don't know what I would. I would have said maybe, don't do it. No, I would have said no. I would have said uh, probably be very careful of who you work with and think about things and uh, try to be perhaps be stick with your craft. I wouldn't have rushed things as much. I was rushing through it because I had so many offers, and I would have maybe been a little more careful of the movies I made and and mm -hmm. who I worked with, perhaps. You know, but it's, I never look back and, and regret anything because, you know, it's, life isn't like that. You have your karma. Everybody has their karma. If you're Napoleon Bonaparte, that's your, that, you know, that's who you are. And if you're, you know, you, you, Jesus Christ, you know, you, it may not end well, you know, on one level, but on another level, that was what you were on this earth to do, put here to do. And I think right. I realize now that I was, put on this earth and I, you know, and I felt it, but I didn't know really how to do it to make people feel better, to entertain them somehow, to make their, to brighten up their day, <laughs> whether I play good guy or bad guy. And that's why now I get it back from people. It's like giving love to your kids. You give your kids love and they give it back to you when you need it. And I think that's what's, that's the relationship that I really enjoy right now with my fans and with the, uh, world is like the older you get the more you put out there the, they start appreciating and I get it back so it's like I think that's why I've done it and I would have given me that advice perhaps as a kid like you're doing the right thing you know don't don't second guess it just go go for it you know go with your instinct it's great perspective it's great perspective. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for the time. The last, last thing, yeah. although you've yeah, done it, yeah. you've, you've peppered it throughout this entire uh, interview. Take my shirt off or no? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> you want to see some choreography from one of the movies? Okay, what is it? What is it? We continue to hear about this unbelievable Stallone impression, and you started, and, and all no, of the research. I don't want to do it. He's going to kill me. He's going to kill me. Uh, no, all of this research you've done it, every, 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 every piece of research came back just saying apparently Dolph has this unbelievable sly impression I don't want to do it because it makes him seem kind of like rock you know like stupid or something I, and he isn't but I but I can do you know this another guy I was you know Michael listen it's excellent no I appreciate it and you, you peppered it throughout we have a cost, I mean, Michael. He's a traitor, remember that. Oh, I'm sorry, I set up the phone. Anyway, so uh, look, I, uh, the Stallone thing, uh, what is it? Uh, I don't want to do it, but if, you know, <laughs> he's going to kill me. 
<laughs> you don't I have to, Dom. Don't, don't worry. I can change. Well, you can change. Oh, I can change. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wanted to have just a little bit of fun with it. I mean, all of the reading I had done about it, I had to at least ask. <laughs> all right. Well, Thank you uh, so much, dude. Thanks, man. We'll talk. We'll talk later. We'll talk soon. Right. Thank you again for you taking the time. The coach, uh, all right, buddy. Take care, man. Bye. Thank you all for listening to another episode of Greenlit, the Buffalo 8 podcast. For financing questions, feel free to contact us at Bondit Media Capital at info at bondit.us. For production, development, and distribution questions, feel free to contact us at Buffalo 8, info at buffalo8.com. We'd love to hear from you and hope you'll continue listening to the podcast episodes ahead.